Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Edgar, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. I'm really happy to be here today. Great. Let's start with a bit about your background. How did you first get interested in the type of work you're doing today? Well, like a lot of people who work in philanthropy, um, I stumbled into the field. Um, I, I did not know that it existed really. And especially being a person who comes from a very low income family and community, uh, institutional philanthropy was something that was very foreign to me. Uh, but I had gone to school for public health and was working in the nonprofit sector for a number of years doing health equity type work in communities, and I was recruited by a foundation. And so I uh, went to the interview and uh, sort of understood that my job was to be to invest millions of dollars around the state of North Carolina to improve the health of communities. And I had a lot of friends um, and mentors saying, oh my God, this is a great job, you gotta take it. So I took the job not fully understanding what philanthropy was um, or what the foundation investment world looked like, um, and uh, really had a great experience, um, but you kind of don't know until you get on the inside. Um, and I, um, yeah, so just kind of happenstance fell into it and have been really learning um, about uh, how I can be more of an advocate to support, you know, equity and racial justice through the years. Awesome. And, um, you know, your, your story to that, uh, can you speak a little bit about the, the rarity of someone from, of Native American ancestry being in philanthropy, and perhaps it's still probably, you can maybe count on two hands like the other <laughs> folks. Yeah, speak a little about that. Yeah. Sure, yeah, that's true. I think when I started in philanthropy, I was maybe one of 10 people that I knew of that worked in, in institutional philanthropy. And as you look at other types of you know, investment organizations, it probably is a much smaller number. Um, today, I can probably name about 25 people, so we're still a, a very small uh, group of folks. And I think it's for a couple reasons. Um, in general, in the space of philanthropy, uh, philanthropy is a, a difficult place, I think, for people of color to, to be successful for a number of reasons. It's a very white dominant culture. It's very insular. Um, it's, you know, there are a limited number of jobs, you know, and, and so uh, we've seen through the years a number of diversity efforts to increase the number of people who work in philanthropy. And then we've seen in recent times a number of people of color actually decreasing uh, due to some of the dynamics uh, and challenges of working inside of the space. Yeah, and I, I love that. I will say to the listeners, Decolonizing Wealth is one of my top five books. I think of all time. I might go there. I definitely have the last like few years <laughs> awesome, because uh, I've similarly, you know, there seems to be a, a, a really good reflective zeitgeist at the moment of sort of looking at, you know, unarmed 
Giri Haradas's book, Winners Take All, being another example. But there seems to be a, a lot of momentum around examining what we think, examining things we're doing that we think are helping and are actually perpetuating white supremacy and colonialism. And could you speak a little bit about, you know, how you came to that realization and just sort of like, what are some of the things that you've noticed working in the field that, that folks should be aware of that, that are sort of leading to that perpetualization of systemic oppression? Yeah, you know, I, I think like most people, when you think of philanthropy you, and charity, um, social impact investing, there's a, a you know, a, a veneer of uh, goodness and kindness uh, and, uh, you know, to, to that, that the people uh, assume connected to that work. And I, and I do believe that's true in general. I don't think that most people who work in philanthropy uh, get up in the morning and say, I can't wait to go to work to be racist today. <laughs> Um, and, you know, but uh, what I realized once I was on the inside that um, that that philanthropy, um, there were so many things that were, uh, you know, just really counterintuitive and unjust um, that were baked into the systems and the processes. Um, in short, when you examine uh, who makes decisions within these institutions and who has power, um, and who, uh, you know, actually benefits from the resources and who's not benefiting from the resources, in spite of what the mission, you know, may say on the website or on the wall of the foundation, um, so few resources are actually being invested in, in communities of color. And so I, in the book, I share some of my personal experiences of uh, being from the community doing what I felt like was an alignment to the foundation strategy and to, uh, to the goal of the foundation uh, by moving resources into uh, the community and to supporting organizations led by people of color, only to find that there was resistance to that and, and challenges to that. And I actually, um, in some cases, felt punished by asking why, asking why not, why it wasn't happening. And so there, um, you know, through all of these activities and sharing this story and sharing these experiences with other people of color and women and marginalized folks who work in this space, I found that, that you know, it wasn't just me. Um, there is a trend um, when, you, when you look at uh, what's going on in institutions that move control money. And ultimately, I think they're broken um, and they are perpetuating, in many cases, um, processes and systems that are further destabilizing our communities and um, perpetuating sort of racist um, systems. And for folks who maybe don't know, how do you define, say, colonization or decolonization uh, and like what that actually means in the context of philanthropy or, or finance? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, when we hear the word colonization, I think it's very normalized for us because we um, we learned about it in school. It's in our history books. And uh, we also think of it as something that happened 500 years ago or 200 years ago. And so uh, it's sort of a retro word that I, I'm, I'm helping to bring back because I think what colonization is is something that continues to happen. It's happening right now. If you watch the evening news, we see colonization happening. And ultimately, colonization is just a, a force. It's a, um, it's, it's a, a force that is, has the mantra of separating and dividing, conquering, exploiting people, um, all for the sake of uh, you know, accumulating wealth. And so those types of uh, what I call the colonizing virus is something that touched our shores 500 years ago um, and has just pervaded every aspect of our being. Um, in, in America, especially, we are really wired to think about um, accumulating more and more and more. We don't know the concept of enough in this country. <laughs> like, when are we rich enough? And so um, that type of mentality, that mantra of colonization, of, of needing more and more and more, and exploiting anyone um, or exploiting the land in the process um, is something that is reflected now in our policies and in our infrastructure and especially um, you know in the realms of wealth and finance and philanthropy you see that colonizing uh, virus or those uh, dynamics of colonization showing up. And we had talked about this a little bit um, beforehand and I think in the beginning of the book you say something around it's like sort of the we all were you know we all are one, like there's no such thing as like separate selves, but the sort of myth of separation was perhaps like the first uh, break for for us to like this, the first sort of false belief that then created 
sort of white supremacy or colonization. And so I'm kind of curious how you see the, like how we got to where we are from that like sort of maybe initial break with being all one to like sort of creating these colon colonists or white supremacist ideas. How does that, how do you see that progression happening? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, you know, whiteness is a concept that was created, right? It's, it's a myth. Uh, the idea that anyone is superior um, or better because of the pigment of, uh, pigment of their skin is, is something that was created to um, create that separation. In order for us to get to a point where we were able to commit genocide, enslave people, exploit uh, folks, low-wage workers, um, to uh, harm the land, we have to be in a mindset that um, we are we are not connected to those folks, and those folks may be even less than human, right? And what what fueled uh, that mindset is actually um, a, a God given, you know, uh, a, a God given superiority that not only are we um, separate, but we are better, and we are, and that that uh, that state is actually justified um, by God. And so that's how you see things happening in our history through the years, um, you know, and even recently, a generation and a half ago or two generations ago, where Native children were taken away from their families and forced into boarding schools, all types of horrific abuses happening, um, stripped of culture and language. Um, the folks who were uh, doing those acts had to uh, completely be absorbed um, and possessed with this idea that these these people are not human, they are not the same. Um, you know, uh, I'm helping them, God has called me to help them and enforce uh, this on them in the name of salvation. And so that, uh, that idea of separation um, is so um, counter native. <laughs> you know, uh, the indigenous worldview is that we are all connected. We're connected to the land. We're connected to animals. And, and I even talk in the book about the, the idea of, um, of you know, uh, livestock and, and when folks begin to think of animals as, as livestock and something that is owned. And the, the major difference between, uh, you know, being indigenous and non-indigenous, as someone described, is that uh, the indigenous worldview um, is that we believe that we belong to the land and the non-indigenous worldview is that we believe the land belongs to us. And that idea of ownership um, is so inherent um, in, in everything when we talk about equity, like the, the equity is a, a conversation that we're bouncing around a lot in this space, uh, in business and in, in philanthropy, uh, but what equity really actually means is shared ownership and power. And that's, um, that's what uh, this is really all about is actually pushing forward an idea of where we can, we can actually reverse that, um, those imbalances and share power. And so do you see, um, do you see white supremacy as a sort of like uh, offshoot of the colonial mindset or are they like, yeah, how do you, how do you, I'm just curious how you relate those two terms in your own mind. See, in, in my mind, I, th I think of white supremacy as the mindset or the, um, you know, it's, it's something that is driven from fear, right? It's driven from, it's, it's a belief that is, that is not real, but it comes from a place of fear and scarcity within itself, right? And, um, and, and that idea of being superior um, then leads to the action of colonization. So I think of colonization as, as an, an action of, of how people are, are responding or behaving um, based off of their idea of supremacy. Okay, that's super helpful for me. Um, and, you know, in the book, one of the things I really appreciate is you, you brought the Native American perspective on the seven steps to healing. Could you talk a little bit about those seven steps and sort of the, how you see us moving forward, sort of like, you sort of do a great job of saying like, we're here and here's like sort of from a Native American perspective, here's some medicine, you know, potentially to bring to this current situation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I do, uh, I think there's, you know, my critique in this book of the accumulation of wealth is really around the trauma that it's caused. Um, I am not anti-wealth. Um, I am not anti-money. And I actually make the case in the book that money is neutral. And if, if money is neutral, then it can actually be used for the good. And so in the indigenous world, we have a, a concept of medicine. Um, anything could be medicine that is something that uh, brings us balance and joy. Um, and, and it really helps restore us. So for example, um, 
if I'm having kind of a blah day and I may have a certain friend that I call that's always going to crack me up on the phone and make me feel better. Right. So that's, that's like medicine for me. And so if we think about money as medicine and those of us who work in organizations where we are gatekeepers for resources, we can actually deploy resources in a way that helps to uh, promote healing. We cannot undo colonization. Like colonization has, has happened. You know, here we are 500 years later, um, you know, when you think about decolonizing wealth, um, that that idea, decolonizing, taken literally, um, it, it really gets stuck as a political process uh, because that would literally mean that land is all the land is turned back over, all the sovereignty is reinstated. To some people, it may mean that like the settlers leave and go back to wherever. Um, and that's really unrealistic in the 21st century uh, when our businesses and families are all intertwined. And so the idea of healing and the seven steps of healing is actually examining the trauma that colonization has, has caused. And then the idea of decolonizing wealth is thinking about how can uh, wealth be used in a way that facilitates healing from that trauma. And so that's, you know, again, thinking of money as, as medicine. If we're moving money to where the hurt is the worst, then we are helping to um, invest resources in a way that is, you know, reconnecting us, repairing us, and uh, supporting that, uh, that healing and, and, you know, restoration of, of our communities that have been so polarized by these ideas of colonization. It's, it's funny because when you mentioned in the book, you know, it's even as a uh, progressive, I, I would consider myself progressive white guy. It was like, um, oh yeah, the British are the colonizers or something. You know, it's like you, you sort of, it, it is like very necessary even for me to realize like we, like I am a colonizer here in the United States. It's not just like this, because I feel like a lot of American textbooks, like the British were like right. everywhere and like owned a fifth of the world. And um it's sort of like, oh yeah, and then there were some Native Americans here, but look at, yeah. So I, I really appreciate point. the book, yeah. No, it's a really good point. And I think, I mean, even for me being Native American, I, I share my personal experience and, you know, I'm vulnerable in the book. And even though, although I'm Native, I have also participated in colonizing behavior. Um, we are, you know, kind of swimming in the water of all of this. And if we're not intentional about our decisions and sort of, you know, deeply reflecting on our analysis around this stuff, it's very easy to, uh, to sort of assimilate to doing business or making investments or practicing philanthropy in a way that is dominant culture and could actually potentially be harmful. Uh, and especially in philanthropy, as a person of color who got in this field that was one of the few, um, I uh, had to, there was a, a forced assimilation. And I knew that in order to um, succeed in this space, I had to be more like them. There was a part of me that I had to give up. Now, I wasn't aware at the time that a lot of this was happening. I was just like, oh, this is how, this is what a good funder does. This is what, um, you know, the leadership that I saw modeling, uh, modeled around me make these kinds of decisions. And so it was only after years of doing work in that way and beginning to see uh, what was happening behind the curtain and then also beginning to feel so deeply disconnected from myself and from my own calling and from my own community that I had to uh, stop and say, wow, I'm actually, I need to decolonize my own life um, and my own thinking around uh, this work. And so I share some of those stories and I think all of us, like the colonizing uh, colonizer virus really impacts us, whether we're a person of color, indigenous or white, um, and the trauma from colonization also impacts all of us, regardless of uh, whether we are descendants of settlers or we're descendants of folks who were colonized. Uh, the trauma from all of that history impacts all of us in different ways. You know, one of the things that also I get frustrated by, and I know it's like even noticing what one of the relics, one of the parts of white supremacy is like moving quickly and like moving past grief towards action. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm being aware of like my own sort of like desire to like, okay, I see a problem. Let's fix it very fast. Um, however, I'm curious how you view, like reading your book, you're talking about how, you know, wealth was accumulated off of, you know, the environment, you know, stealing land from Native Americans and on the backs of African Americans in slavery, um, primarily. And then it was stolen twice because we don't pay taxes on the money. 
So you, you sort of have like stolen money twice. Right. And it, it sort of leads me to believe that like, if you are a foundation or a wealthy person, should you not within like, like why should any foundations be in perpetuity? Like why should they not all spend down to zero within five years <laughs> or like one year? Uh, like what, do you have any thoughts on like sort of like that redistribution of wealth that needs to happen? And like, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really complicated. I, and, and you're definitely right, Ryan. I, I think of this money um, as, as twice stolen because, and, and what's really unjust in that is that foundations, for example, kind of slicing off just part of the social impact world are sitting on $800 billion of wealth and then are only required by the U S government to pay out 5% of grants. And then of that 5%, um, you know, very, a, a very small percentage, um, our best year so far is that 8% of the 5% was invested in communities of color. And so what you see there is uh, a, a huge uh, injustice with foundations focused more on, on accumulating more wealth, only regraining out what was intended to be uh, a minimum, but that has become the maximum. And then um, very few of those dollars getting to communities of color. And so that type of behavior by foundations does make me question like, uh, you know, why does this need to go on in perpetuity? Uh, when we have crises happening um, all around us right now, we see the impacts of the race wealth uh, gap, um, you know, all around us in our communities where, um, you know, communities have been systematically um, marginalized from these resources for decades. And so I think that any foundation that is going into perpetuity has to really uh, examine themselves and ask why. Um, I really do. I love the idea when foundations go, go through a process to, um, to do that work and they decide to spend down. I think there are great examples of folks who have made that decision and why. And so, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's something to be examined. Um, I do think there's a role for philanthropy to play in, uh, in sort of like a reparations kind of model. In the book, I call for um, an immediate action where foundations could take 10% of their assets, so the $800 billion. Uh, you know, if you don't want to spend down, that's a conversation that you want to think through. Well, in the meantime, <laughs> maybe you could take 10% of your, the money that you're sitting on and just hand that over to communities of color. Um, there are ways to begin to, uh, you know, I think foundations can play a role in helping to um, close that race wealth gap and then also to um, support some research and um, some, some, you know, uh, some ways of exploring how reparations actually might be um, something that's feasible um, to be implemented in this country. I'm also interested in your thoughts on the concept of market rate returns. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like market rate for who, like, because of why, <laughs> you know, it's like usually the question, it's like, well, I want my, you know, I don't want to make a concessionary investment. I want to have a market rate. Can you talk about the, the problematic, I, I guess like this is another relic of white supremacy and myself too, is like, there's, there's like this idea that we need to hospice out the old economy and like birth in the new economy. Right. So people who are investing in impact, but still want market rate returns, you could make an argument that they're sort of like trying to hospice out just pure extractive wealth. But I also get really impatient with those people. And I'm like, well, why, do, why don't you just invest in stuff that's like 1% return, but is like really high impact? Or, or can you speak at all? Like, how do you balance that in your own conversations or your own thought process? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, it goes, it all goes back to like, what is this all about anyway? Like philanthropy, social impact investing, all of that, you know, it, it's supposed to be, be about human gain. It's supposed to be about, about uh, change in communities. That is, that is the return that we're looking, we're supposed to be looking towards and not a return on the market. And I tell a story in the book um, about one foundation that I was working at. And uh, we had, um, you know, like most private foundations, we paid out 5% of our assets to grant making. And so I don't recall one single time in working there that we had a celebration because like, wow, this was our biggest grant making year ever. We gave away more money. In fact, like, or like, oh, look what's going on in the world right now. Look, this is a political moment. This is, you know, our communities are, are suffering at an all time high. Maybe we'll give out more this year. 
Uh, rather, there was a focus on the investments and the endowment of the foundation. And every time we hit uh, a certain new level of, uh, of growth, we would have an ice cream party. And I, I, you know, and I remember sitting around eating this ice cream thinking like, this is sort of ridiculous. Like we're celebrating that we are richer versus uh, you know having put more money out the door so those are some of the dynamics that i that make me question the net value of philanthropy um you know and and, and beyond sort of like the the percentage of returns which is something to be examined um what folks are actually invested in like where are these um where foundations in particular are investing um, is something that is um, that most people people don't realize for the most part foundations are actually invested in a way uh, that in, in industries um, and in funds that have no type of uh, value attached and you know I can tell you of one foundation in particular um, when Standing Rock was happening they made a generous grant to support you know the the Native American folks on the ground fighting um, for their communities, but that same foundation on the 95% of their, um, you know, investment side was invested in the oil company and refused to have a conversation about um, divesting from from uh, that company. And so when you look at, uh, you know, what's actually happening on the investment side, uh, the types of investments that are being made um, that are counterintuitive to the actual mission <laughs> of most foundations, um, you know, I, I, I really do wonder what the net value of philanthropy might actually be. And how have your, how has your message been received in the industry? Are, are you sort of like, are people like turning their heads away <laughs> or are they welcoming or what is, what's been your experience so far? You know, quite the contrary. I mean, I'll be honest and say in writing this book, I had a lot of anxiety at different times. One, uh, just from remembering my own experiences that I had kind of suppressed or forgotten about that the book calls me to sort of relive. But um, also, I decided if I was going to write this book, I was really going to go there and, and speak truth to power. Um, not, but also, you know, in, in my way, and in my way is sort of uh, bringing people in in a spirit of love and understanding. But I also um, feel a sense of urgency to let's let's talk about what's real, right? Let's get to the heart of this and really try to uh, let's turn on the light, you know, so we can see what is what and then deal with it. And so um, I was anxious um, about speaking truth to power. Um, I will say there were a few folks who um, are leaders in the field that I shared an early copy of the book with who told me they were concerned for my safety, they were concerned for my career. Um, some of them did they love the book and they didn't want me to change anything, but they did not want to publicly endorse my book. And so, the, of course, those early types of uh, reflections made me a little bit more terrified. A couple times I was like, why am I doing this? Am I doing the right thing? But I have to say, Ryan, since the book came out, it's been quite the opposite. I mean, I am um, speaking at philanthropy and investment conferences all over the country. Um, I just heard earlier this week the publisher is going into the second printing of the book because it's just being sold out in places. And I think people, um, you know, I think those of us in this work are ready for this conversation, right? Um, we are um, gotten to, you know, the, the world is at a certain point that we cannot continue doing business as usual. Um, I think uh, we've been bouncing around ideas of inclusion and diversity and equity for some time. So to really get to the heart of the matter, um, around dismantling white supremacy and really holding up a mirror and asking all of us, you know, all of ourselves, like what, uh, how are we, what is our role in that? How are we participating in that? What do we need to do to make those changes? Um, is something that I think people are really ready for, you know, the realness of it all. So that's, um, so I'm really happy with uh, the way that the field has, uh, you know, supported this work. And can you speak at all? Did you know Peter Buffett and his and his wife? Is it Jennifer? Or yeah. yeah, did you know Peter and Jennifer before, or or did you get to know them through the book? Or can you talk a little bit about like how that was? Because they're obviously pretty famous, wealthy people. I guess. Yeah, you know. So you know, and when I was writing the book, I kind of just put together a list of folks I wanted to have a conversation with. I talked to activists. I talked to. Um, you know, folks that I felt like were sort of uh, thought leaders or very progressive thinkers around some of these issues. And the Novo Foundation, which is the foundation that Jennifer and Peter started, 
um, is a foundation that I've worked with. I know people who work there and they fund in a way that I think really reflects a lot of the values uh, in this book. Um, and so I was meeting with some of their staff and talking with Pamela Schiffman, who is their executive director about this work. And she uh, said, you've, Jennifer and Peter, you got to talk to Jennifer and Peter about it. They're going to love this. It's great. And so they um, wanted to have a meeting and I drove to their offices for, I think, what was scheduled to be like a one hour interview. And I was there for several hours, I think like five hours. So it was uh, it was really um, a, a magical conversation. And for me, it um it gave me hope that what I wanted, the change I wanted to see in the world, and especially from folks who have privilege and who have wealth, um, you know, I, I, I grew to understand that there is actually a process that people can go through to, um, to understand the responsibility um, that you have and to also sort of liberate. Um, Peter often says that uh, they like to take money out, out of its misery as a, as a quote that he, he puts out there a lot. And so I was like, wow, these folks are onto something um, that uh, if everyone who had money and privilege and power um, invested their resources in, in this kind of way, the world would be a much better place. And then I was, you know, really thrilled to know that um, their, their connection to indigenous communities, uh, Peter had written uh, the score to uh, the movie Dances with Wolves, which is sort of this like native, uh, of, you know, inspired or native, a movie that has natives in it, haven't seen it in some time. But, uh, you know, that was sort of his first, uh, you know, kind of first encounter with, with indigenous people or, and, or, you know, at least issues around that movie. And he, um, you know, began connecting more deeply with sort of indigenous knowledge and communities. And I was like, that's where it is. It's writing my own community. Like we are resilient. We have a lot of ideas about the economy and existing and taking care of one another and being, um, being in this thing together, in this thing called life together that I think could actually um, be the answer to supporting a, a transformational mind shift in the areas of philanthropy and finance. Yeah, I think one thing that you spoke to really well, maybe not, yeah, explicitly and sort of implied is I think part of the challenge in philanthropy and social impact investing is sort of a, a lot of white people in power or just white people like me who are like, we don't understand that you don't like colonialism or white supremacy does not have to be conscious and intentional to be that. It can be unconscious and unintentional. And that's what majority of white supremacy is. And so I really appreciated you. Can you speak at all about like, have you, have people come to you and said like, wow, you helped me realize this that I was doing that like I didn't recognize or any stories that, that have come up in the past few months around that? Yeah. And I, I think you're exactly right, Ryan. I mean, there's obviously, you know, blatant white supremacist, you know, crazy folks out there, right, who are uh, doing terrible things. But I, I think in general, especially for folks who work in the nonprofit sector, folks who work in the, you know, social impact um, and philanthropy arenas, um, tend to um, have their heart and intentions in the right places. And so much of what may be happening is unconscious. And so, um, you know, I, I think what sort of a, a side effect of this book that I had not intended, and, and you know, um, I'll tell this story um, that's sort of related to your question. <laughs> but after the election um, last two years ago now, I um, was feeling kind of angry, right? Um, and upset and like, uh, like most, like a lot of people uh, in my community, especially. And I spent some time in, in my home community in North Carolina. I was talking to an elder of mine about how I was feeling. And I was like, I'm kind of like angry at white people. I don't want to be around a lot of white people right now. I just wanted to be in, in, in a bubble of my community. And she um, really helped me and reminded me of sort of the native value of all my relations. And that is that we're all related. And she's like, Edgar, regardless of how anyone voted, regardless of how different someone may be from you or you know, their, how different their background may be from you, they are your relatives and you have to love them. And so that's, uh, that, that's a value that I began taking with me into this work and then writing this book to understand, man, my community has suffered. There's a lot of trauma, but there's also just pain and suffering everywhere. 
And if, if we can actually, those of us who are people of color can um, actually make space in the movement and uh, be uh, a little, um, you know, understanding of, of that, of, of white folks who are well-meaning and but are just unconscious, there might be an opportunity for us to actually bring them in to help them become conscious. I think even on the progressive side of things, we tend to be uh, quite polarized and we um, not having the patience for one another, not um, having grace for one another. And, you know, I was just talking with someone the other day who said, what if right now, why if it, why, what, what if right now in 2018, uh, someone was having their wake up moment, right? How would we treat them? Would we, would we bring them in um, or would we, um, you know, blame and, and polarize and push them out because they're not quite as progressive as we've come to be? I think for all of us, it's been a journey. You know, I'm from, I'm from a very conservative family. I'm from the South. I'm from a, you know, a native family. And so I have not always seen things the way that I see them now. It's been an evolution. And so, uh, you know, the way that I begin all of these conversations with folks where I'm invited is uh, beginning with a, a statement. And that is that I will not ever judge you. I will not judge you. I'm not, I'm not the uh, racial justice police. I'm not the equity police. Um, anyone who invites me in for a conversation, um, I see that as, um, as a privilege because if you're wealthy and white, you don't have to be interested in this stuff. You don't have to want to do the, the right thing um, or to understand how uh, you know, our history or our race has had a role in the accumulation of your wealth or in your giving. And so I've been very fortunate. I have sat in the offices of the top of the 1% of this country, and I've been invited in for these conversations because I think that that type of approach of, you know, I see the good in you. I know that you're not intentionally wanting to harm communities, but let's have a, a real conversation about, um, you know, why people of color may be angry, why, uh, why things are unjust as they are, and how you have to actually deal with your whiteness. Like you can't take the, you can't have that luxury of not, um, of, of, of not, uh, not dealing with the whiteness of it all. And so, um, but the approach and the spirit of, of helping folks understand um, all of that in a non-judgmental way, I think has really um, been um, welcomed by a lot of folks. One, one of the parts of the book that I got really emotional about and was very powerful for me was the story of the, the white philanthropist lady who was writing the apology letter and sort of just like dealing with that on the, cause I think in the seven steps to healing grief is the first one. Right? right. And so I think that's a lot of white Americans, I think feel that if we start thinking about this, I can't handle the grief, but that then we can't even start the seven steps. Right. Um, can you tell that story of the woman and like what she sort of was processing and realized? Yeah, no, I'm so glad you, you mentioned that. And, and earlier you, you mentioned sort of the quick fix, right? Like the, the white dominant culture way is to say, Edgar, give us the, the quick steps. We want this to go away. We don't want to feel things, but um, grief is definitely a part of the, the, the process of healing. Um, and we, we have to acknowledge the hearts that we've endured. We have to acknowledge the role that the accumulation of wealth has played um, in this country and kind of reopen those wounds and grieve them in order to get to a place uh, to be able to move forward in, in, a, in a very healthy way. And so, yeah, Hillary is a, a, is a, a person who is a trustee of a foundation who has become a friend. Um, and I first met Hillary at a conference. It was actually sort of an indigenous conference. And um, I was on a panel and she was on this panel with me. And honestly, when I saw that she was on this panel, my first thought was like, who is this white lady that's on this panel at this native conference? And all these, you know, uh, other natives were kind of gloating around her and saying, you know, she was an honorary sister. So I was a little suspicious at first, you know, um, and, you know, thinking that, oh, wow, this is like our space and you're, why are you here? And so I, um, I eventually heard her story and began to open myself to connecting with her. And again, you know, this is my own trauma, right? My own trauma coming into place of, of not being open, my own, you know, biases. And so long story short, Hillary um, married into a family with wealth and was kind of grappling with this, this, uh, this newfound privilege. 
And one of the things that she did was to do explore where the, where the wealth came from. And she actually found that her family went, uh, traced back to North Carolina and had owned slaves in the same community where I'm from in North Carolina. And so she was actually moved to, uh, well, she grieved that. She was like, what a horrible thing to find out. And then uh, how does she begin to grapple with that? And um, she felt led to then sort of to apologize, knowing that um, no one may accept her apology. Who like people may say, who cares? You, we don't know you. But she actually wrote a letter to me that I shared an excerpt from in the book, um, where she apologized to me and to my ancestors, and um, in a way that on the surface sounds like, wow, like, yeah, like someone saying they're sorry, but it really transformed me because I had never heard that before. As a native person who is still grappling with extreme poverty in my family, when I visit my family back in North Carolina, you know, I, I see the decades of oppression like all around. Um, no one has ever apologized or said, I'm sorry that my ancestors had a role in contributing to all of this, right? And so it um, completely broke down every wall that I had, um, you know, towards her. And we were able to connect in the way that uh, brought healing to her life and healing to my life. And then what also, the last point I'll, I'll say about her is not only did she apologize to me, and then she since has written letters to several other people of color where she's felt led. Um, she apologized to white people and um, she apologized for sort of judging them um, instead of allowing herself, you know, uh, you know, she, since she kind of like became woke, she became sort of judgmental of other white people. So instead of seeing other white people as her relatives, she began to want to hide away and be more in, in progressive communities of color. So she also apologized for her, um, sort of cultural amnesia is, is how she describes it. So I think, I mean, those are the two first steps of the seven steps of healing that, that grieving process. Uh, becoming aware and like sitting in the discomfort and the grief of that until it works its way through your body and you can get to a place where you're then ready to apologize. Yeah, that it was just that story plus the um, the story of the the white guy at the presentation, like sh showing the slide of the slaves that his family owned. I was crying when I read you know, her story and this guy's story because I was like, I I have had some genealogy done in my family. And in the summary, it was like, and there were slaves in the family. I'm like, okay, like, I know that now. And like, that's super embarrassing and shameful. But now it's like, I'm almost, I'm actually pushed to like, I need to know like about this. Like, I can't just say like, oh, I hope, or like, that was the past. I'm different. Like, I need to like sort of understand my own lineage and like the harm. And so I just wanted to thank you for putting those stories in. Cause I think it's pushed me to say like, I need to know like the names of the slaves that my family owned and like what is the apology or like you know reparations or something like I, like that's it's sort of taken me into the, like the deep grief and so i just wanted to thank you for putting those in yeah there's power in that for sure yeah um well <laughs> i'm trying to like keep it keep it somewhat light here but uh no this is good um so next you know I, we got about five more minutes left um let's see one question I sometimes ask guests is, what do people never ask you that you wish they did? Hmm. Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews lately, so I'm trying to think of, um, you know, um, I, I think that, you know, I think it's interesting. A, a lot of, um, I thought that more people would be interested about my personal um life and journey. I do share some of my story uh, in the book. And in a way, I sort of hit it and quit it, right? Like I, I touch on it. But those stories were, there's so many stories I did not include that were like super painful and, and whatnot that drove me to write the book. And so um, I thought that there would be probably more questions about some of some of those, you know, the juicy stories of like, where I was working and what, what went down there. I'm kind of glad that people haven't asked me those questions because I think that, um, you know, I'm talking to a lot of folks who are ideas people, right? And it's like, we, we, we don't want to talk about people or places, but we want to talk about the ideas in the book. So that's been like super refreshing. Um, I think only one person has asked me, where do we go from here with this? <laughs> 
and I'm and you know and the answer is I really don't know I think I, I want to be a part of um, sort of like a, a healing campaign um, I want I, I just I feel like if, if this is a message that even outside of business outside of philanthropy um, impact investing space if we can uh, find a way to popularize this this message and get it out there um, you know, I think that we can be better neighbors and, and better family members. Um, and just even like, gosh, I mean, I was getting a haircut today and watching the news about the, the shooting last night in California. There has to be some type of drastic shift in the way that we are connecting to each other as, as people in this country. So, um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I think the, the question that I'm not getting asked is like, how do we make that happen? Um, and I really don't know. I hope that listeners will, will, you know, of course, read the book, share ideas, connect with me um, around helping get this message out. And then I hope that people will just put it to practice and um, in their lives um, and in their own with their own families. And so I have been in my own family with my with my mom, with my brother, um, others just, you know, practicing this. And it's not. Um, it's hard to have these difficult conversations and sometimes especially with people that we love <laughs> and people that we respect and look up to look up to and so i'm just interested in uh, hearing back from folks about how we can spread spread this gospel um and um, how we can make it apply and fit into the various aspects of, of places where folks are are um you know influencing dollars that need to be unleashed and invested into communities that are really hurting so that was a roundabout way of, uh, I guess I was kind of making an ask of the listeners versus an ask of me, but um, that is uh, a hope that I wanted to express. And is there anyone else, um, any other people that you look to as really leading in this area that if folks are interested in learning more, they can sort of seek those people out or, or resources? Yeah, I mean, oh God, there's so many um, uh, I think great thought leaders out there who um, are working in the philanthropy space. Uh, Vanessa Daniel is someone that I really respect, who is the executive director of the Groundswell Fund. It's a fund that is supporting, um, you know, a sort of a feminist fund for women of color and trans women. Vanessa wrote an article called uh, "America Is on Fire: White People Watch Your Move," and uh, every time she writes anything, um, I. Is, it's just so powerful and right on. So I think she has an analysis that is very valuable to uh, the idea of, of you know racial equity and racial justice um, in this space. Um, I also lift up you know a couple models in the book um, of funds that are indigenous led funds like the Seventh Generation Fund, like the Potlatch Fund. Those are really great models to see where people are actually practicing investing in grant making in a sort of indigenous way. And so um, check those folks out as well. Great. And then where can folks learn more about your work? And uh, obviously, everyone, if you have not checked out the book, it's uh, Decolonizing Wealth, Indigenous Wisdom to Heal Divides and Restore Balance. And um, I highly recommend the audio book because the uh, gentleman who reads it is excellent. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I grew, yeah. So where, where can folks learn more about, about your work? So uh, decolonizingwealth.com is a website we put together. Um, there you can find um, additional blog posts that I've written. Uh, we also have uh, different places where I'm speaking and connecting with folks around the country. So please go there, sign up for our newsletter to stay engaged or to connect. The book is available uh, anywhere books are sold. Um, you can definitely order it through the website. And we also just launched uh, some really cool t-shirts that are uh, decolonizer t-shirts. And so uh, the t-shirt um, and the, uh, the book, all the proceeds are supporting native youth. And so not only am I trying to contribute to uh, shaking up the conversation, um, I'm using this platform and this opportunity to raise money to support uh, native youth. And so I um, invite you to go there and check out the book um, as well as uh, get yourself a decolonizer t-shirt if you want to be a part of this movement to, um, you know, close the race wealth gap. Excellent. Well, uh, Edgar, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. That concludes this episode of Next Economy Now. And now on to our mini interview with Doug Bistry, CEO of Clearinghouse CDFI. Okay, welcome, Doug, to this interview series, the Next Economy Now podcast. And 
you know, for listeners, I think one of the reasons I'm excited about Clearinghouse CDFI is that you're a lot different than other financial institutions. And so what's the secret sauce then? Because, you know, 18 years of profitability, investing in what many, maybe other financial institutions would consider risky or, you know, something that they're not as interested in. Do you have any sort of principles that have allowed you to stay, you know, profitable and while also creating impact in these communities? Well, I, I would point to two things. Um, I, I think, you know, our corporate culture and, and the way we approach business and lending and running uh, this CDFI, I think is critical. And, and I know we'll talk a little bit about that. But number two, generally two, we, we are a collateral-based lender. And so we are, you know, while we've done some loans that don't have collateral or have non-traditional collateral, um, for the most part, most of our lending is collateral-based. And, and I think that's helped us a lot. Um, we've had, uh, as any lender will, we've had some borrowers that, that haven't been able to pay us back. And uh, we've had some difficulties with, with particular loans, but by and large, our credit department has done a great job of identifying ways that we can mitigate the risk, find a way to make a loan. It's difficult, have the security that we know we do have some collateral in case there's a, a, an event of default. But, you know, by and large, uh, our loans are performing. And I would say, you know, really our, our loss rate over our 22-year uh, history is less than 1% of actual losses we've taken. Um, and, and again, a large part of that is the fact that we are uh, a collateral-based lender. Wow, less than 1% too. I, it's incredible. And if we shift to some of the, the, the best practice ideas, I think a lot of folks who listen to this interview may, may want to know things about you know, what you've learned over your of your 20, I think 22 years, is that right? Since Yeah, we're years. in tw yeah. 20, 22 years. Uh -huh. So one that, that's a constant struggle or opportunity for companies is building a great employee culture. And I'm wondering if you could speak to what you've learned about how, how do you build a great employee culture and are, are there any unique cultural practices you have? You can speak about? Yeah, it's, it, it's such an important thing to me as the president and CEO to um, identify support and try to get buy-in in our uh, corporate culture. It's probably, you know, in the top three things I do as the president and CEO. And so I do spend a lot of time both thinking about it and working on it. And, and I think, um, Ryan, what we have done, and, and I didn't do this out the gate. I, I, I think it was actually during the financial crisis. It was probably in about, um, you know, 2009 or to, you know, 2010, where I really sat down and I said, you know, I think we have these, uh, we have a corporate culture, but it, it, it wasn't really well articulated. And so, you know, I sat down and, and, and worked with some of the people on my team and, and I came up with seven uh, personal corporate cultural traits. And that would be things that we expect from our employees and seven business corporate cultural traits. And, and uh, they're written down, they're identified. And when I hire any new employee at any level, uh, within 30 days, I sit down with that employee. And if there's two or three hires at the same time, we have a, a group of them. And I, I walk through these uh, corporate cultural traits and, and explain to them that, you know, this is who we are, this is our company, and, and this is what we expect. And, and I think, I don't know if that's unique or not, but it's been something that, that I'm very proud of. And I think it has helped us create a great employee culture. And where can folks learn more about Clearinghouse and, you know, say if there's any investors who are interested, what's the best way for them to get in contact? We have a great website that has a ton of information, including our financials. Um, it is www.ccdfi.com. Again, that's cc dfi.com and uh, a lot of information there there's contact numbers um, I'd be happy to uh, to talk to anybody that uh, is serious about uh, investing or working with us and also you know we're looking for projects to lend um, you know good projects and so and in our service area is uh, California Arizona Nevada New Mexico 
in all of Indian country throughout the United States. So if anyone is aware of an unmet credit need that has a good community impact or, you know, uh, often our loans are made to entrepreneurs, uh, people of color or, or members of groups that have been disenfranchised. And uh, if anyone is aware of loans, boy, we'd love to hear from them as well. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.